the Holy Gospel is taken from St. Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Why do we plant trees? You know, I... I know at first that may seem kind of like a silly question because most of us know that trees are good for the environment. They, they take in carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen. We won't get into that chemical process. I saw the way every one of you were looking at Miss Beth when she was doing that chemistry lesson there too. Oh. <laughs> but this is an important thing to know, especially for those of us who need oxygen to live. Trees provide shade. Relief from the sun. They provide us with paper, with wood for our houses, and for heating those houses. Trees are really important. But why do we plant them? I mean, think about it for just a moment. How long does it take for a tree to grow to maturity? How long does it take for a tree to grow large enough to provide shade for a house? How long does it take for a tree to grow to become large enough to produce a board or, or a log that will burn for hours? How long does it take for a tree to grow up so that you can safely sit underneath its branches without worry from the sun? It takes a long time. Depending on what variety of tree, it could take 10 to 20 years for such a thing to happen. So let me ask again. In this day of instant gratification, instantaneous access to information, wanting to have things now, 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 why do we plant trees? And if we're nearing the twilight of our lives, why even bother knowing that it is unlikely that we will be able to experience the fruit of our work? Why do we plant trees? Let's pray. Gracious God, Your kingdom comes without our prayer and without our work. But we pray that it may come to us. May we acknowledge You as King and as Lord, that our hearts may be changed and our eyes may be opened, that we may know, see, and participate in the growing of Your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, generally, I hate rap music. You know, long ago, when my wife and I were in college, uh, we went to a couple of events in San Antonio, uh, headlined by George Strait. These were the George Strait Music Festivals. I don't know if any of you experienced one of these things, but they were awesome. George would bring in like eight or nine different groups to come and perform so you're like all day at this concert. My wife and I loved country music. So at these concerts, we got to see like George Strait, Brooks and Dunn, Winona, and one of my personal favorites, Doug Stone. Now, at this time also, in the 90s, I mean, and by the way, if you didn't recognize any of those names, you are truly deprived. <laughs> but that's beside the point. Point is this, during that time period in the early 90s, 
rap was becoming really popular. And there were some country artists who tried to incorporate some rap in the country. I was not a big fan of this. Doug Stone was not either. And it was funny because he got up on stage one evening and he let his feelings be known. In the middle of his concert, he stopped and he started talking about this, talking about this country rap. And he says, you know what? I've renamed this thing. I've given it a name. And he took the first letter in country, the three words of rap, combined them together. <laughs> it was a word that meant the same thing as dung. I couldn't argue with him. I agreed wholeheartedly. That's the way I felt about rap. But I'm having to seriously rethink my position on this genre, not because I've embraced all of rap music fully, but because of an artist that I was introduced to just this past week. See, it happened because of a page I follow on Facebook. Some of you may be familiar with the Babylon Bee, which is a Christian satire site. Well, they have a sister site called Not the Bee. Not the Bee is not satire, it's their opinion. It leans very much to the right. And I know for some of you that might give it a black eye. But you see, I, I, I try to look at stuff across the political spectrum so I know what folks are saying. Now, in this particular article, Not the Bee was highlighting a rapper by the name of Tom McDonald. Now, Tom is a rapper who sings on the right hand of the political spectrum, and he is not a fan of cancel culture which is what the, Not the Bee was talking about. For those of you who remember a sermon I preached several months ago, you'll know that I'm no fan of cancel culture either. So I was intrigued by what Not the Bee said, and I listened to some of the lyrics and the videos that were listed on there. And then the next morning, I came here to church, and I googled Tom McDonald uh, on, on Facebook, I mean on a Facebook, on YouTube, and I saw a list of all of his videos. He's got a lot of music. There was one video that caught my attention. The name of the video was Church. So I listened to it. Man, who hit me down here. Cut me to the core. It troubled me. Why? Because this song gave me some deep insight into folks who struggle with faith. They struggle with God. They struggle with what it means to be a Christian, particularly in light of addiction. And I want to quote to you this morning the last verse and the chorus of this particular song. It goes this way. I can't read, but the Bible's still with me. My eyes can't see from the bottles of whiskey. I don't believe anybody will miss me, and I'm on my knees. Tell me, God, are you listening? I pray on my way to the liquor store that they lock the door because I'll lay in my grave if the whiskey pours like it did before. I'm scared. I send out a prayer. Can anybody hear me? Is anybody there? Because honestly, it hurts and every day is worse. I keep buying whiskey when all I need is church. Now, there's a whole lot more to that song. And I confess that that song and music video opened my eyes to the struggle who is trying, trying desperately to deal with pain and frustration and hurt. Who knows that their behavior is destructive and wants a way out. They've heard about God. They've heard about the church. They've heard about prayer. They know they should do all those things. And they do them. They fall on their knees. They pray. They ask God to speak. And God is silent. So they're met with bewilderment. Even in engaging all of these things, they wonder, does anybody care? They still feel dead inside. They still hurt. And despite all, <laughs> despite knowing that all they need is church, they keep buying whiskey because it's the only thing that dulls the pain. It's the only thing that makes them feel alive. I hate rap music. But I love that song. I love that song even though I hate the truth that it speaks to. And that truth is this. There's deep pain in the world. There's deep pain in people. 
And sometimes, oftentimes in desperation, they turn to God, they turn to prayer, they turn to the church. And they're met with silence. And please don't hear me as making an accusation towards the church or God or demeaning prayer, because that's not my point, not in the least. You see, I, I know what it's like to desperately turn to God in prayer and be met with silence. I know what it's like to feel like you're walking through the fires of hell and feel like you're all alone. I've been there in that place. I know that hurt. I know that pain. I'm not going to share that story with you now because some of those wounds still aren't fully healed. But just know, I know. But the thing is, I didn't turn to whiskey. I, I didn't ever feel like I wasn't alive. I didn't feel like I was deep in the grave and, and would stay there because I had something to hold on to. And that's something made all the difference in the world. And it's that something that Jesus is speaking to in our gospel lesson this morning. And he speaks to it with two parables, which are about the kingdom of God. And the first parable is perhaps not as famous as the second, but they walk hand in hand to tell us very, something very, very important about God. <clears throat> and the first parable is this. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He doesn't know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. The second and more famous parable is the parable of the mustard seed. Where Jesus says, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. And yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and it puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now contrary to what I used to usually do in the sermon, I'm not going to delve into any deep exegesis on this parables. I'm not going to dig through the Greek text and offer any nuances of the language that will unlock these parables and explain them in a perfect manner. Because these parables invite the use of your imagination especially as you try to get your head around them. But even as you do that, even as you try to use your imagination with these, as you may try to understand exactly what they mean, let me point out something very, very important to you. Don't let your imagination make these parables about you. Because they're not. Don't look at these parables and ask, well, what does this parable tell me I need to do? These parables aren't about you. These parables aren't about me. These parables are about God. And particularly, the emergence of God's kingdom. You see, this is the perfect time to give you the not-so-subtle reminder that Christianity is not primarily about we do, but it is primarily about God's action and what God has done, is doing, and will do. And God is bringing His kingdom. God's kingdom is emerging in the world. That's what these parables are about. God's kingdom is here. It's happening right now. As I speak, as we worship, as we live and move and work in the world, God's kingdom is taking root, moving, growing, making things ready for the time when Jesus will return in His full glory to establish the kingdom fully. God's kingdom is on the move, not only in the world, but also in our hearts and in our lives. But here's the question. Here's the burning question. It's the question embodied in Tom McDonald's video, Music, church. It's the burning question that seems to come forward when we look at the world and see the world moving further and further away from Christian ideals and thought. It's the burning question of everyone who has gotten on their knees and begged God to speak only to hear silence. Where is it? Where is the kingdom? I mean, you say it's moving. Jesus says it's moving. But all you see is pain and suffering. All I see and feel is misery. The cries of the victims go unanswered. And those who are in power are indifferent. Where is this kingdom that you speak of? 
Where is this God who supposedly cares? That question deserves an answer. And I would like to try in the next few moments to answer it. But to give an answer means to delve into some very important Christian doctrine. And I will try to simplify that as much as possible. But please know, in a very real way, I'm only giving this a glancing blow. For those of you who are struggling, who are longing for this answer, I apologize now if it's not as satisfactory as it should be. But maybe, just maybe, it will strike a chord. And I hope and pray that it will open your eyes just a smidge to see a different reality. You see, the first thing we have to do is admit how broken and sinful we are. And I mean, if you're a person like Tom is describing in this song, you already know your brokenness. You already know your failures because you face them every single day. You don't need me to push you to know that. But here's the thing. Do you realize the extent of your failure? And I want to be clear before I go into this too much deeper. I'm not standing up here trying to be self-righteous and condemn you. Because while some of our failures are not the same, there's one failure that you and I both share. There's a failure that all of us as human beings share. It's not a failure that I'm proud of in the least. In fact, I'm not proud of it at all because it actually disqualifies me from being a pastor and preaching. It's how bad it is. That failure is this. We have not allowed God to be God. We've wanted to be gods ourselves. We want to call all the own shots in our lives. We want to have control over our, our lives and not just over our lives. We want control over other people's lives too. We want them to do what pleases us. We want the world to cater and serve our every whim. And that's the original sin. Selfishness. Me above all else. And it's debilitating because when we long for God and we want God's kingdom, we're prevented from seeing it because we're trying to sit on the throne. It ends up making us miserable in the long run. And here's the hell of it. Here's the real hell of it. It's not like we can change ourselves here. It's not like we can reach into our hearts and make them not want to be in control. It's not like we have the power and, and capability and capacitating capacity of overcoming our own selfishness. Because, I mean, face it, we like being in charge. So something's got to give to make us not think of us. And that's something. That something is Grace. Grace is knowing that God knows our failure. And, and God knowing our failure and, and knowing our selfishness and knowing our rebelliousness and desire to overthrow Him and, and sit on His throne. It's Him knowing that we deserve punishment and death for this rebellion. It's Him taking on human flesh and then living the life that we were supposed to live and then dying the death that we deserve so He would pay for our failure It's God dying for us when we least deserved it, which is unleashing a love that we are almost incapable of understanding. It is that sacrificial love and dying for sinners that changes our hearts on the deepest level. Because when you get it, I mean, when you, when you get grace and you see what God has done on the cross, yeah, you know you're a failure. But you also know that you are deeply loved. And in the midst of your brokenness, you find an eternal God-given love. And that eternal God-given love changes you. It changes you deeply. I mean, you no longer want to be king. You are content with being a servant, a servant of God and a servant of others in the world. You no longer live for yourself. You live for God. You live for Christ. And when that, when that occurs, when you change and you start living for Christ, you focus on Jesus and you remember that Christ was crucified and He suffered. He went through immense pain and agony, but He was raised from the dead. 
And that raising from the dead, by the way, was the beginning of God's kingdom breaking in on the earth. And when you realize that, when you, when you realize what God did in that resurrection, God brought life from death. God brought healing out of suffering. And you understand that God is still in that process. God is still bringing life from death. God is still bringing healing and restoration out of suffering. These are the things that you begin to see when your eyes are opened and your heart is changed. These are the things of the kingdom of God, which though they may be hidden, they will one day appear. And that's what we trust even when we don't hear an answer. We trust that this will happen. We trust that God will change things. We trust that suffering will turn into joy. We trust that death will be brought to resurrection. In short, we have hope. You see, that's why when I was in the midst of my trial, I didn't turn to whiskey or any other such thing. I had hope. That's also why we plant trees. We may never see that tree in the fullness of its growth, but we have hope that it's going to get there and that someone someday will experience it fully. That's that message of hope is the one that God is bringing to us today. See, because of what God has done, we have hope in what God is doing and what God will do. We have hope that God is acting even when we cannot see. We have hope that God is working in our lives to transform and to redeem. We have hope that God's kingdom is coming to us right now. We have hope. And my prayer today is that if you think God is quiet, if you're hurting and finding things worse, I pray that you'll find that hope. I pray that you will find grace. I pray that you will find Jesus. And then go plant a tree. Amen.